AK Bingo. <laughs> AK, I'm going to look into that. Uh, yeah, it's something, I think it's AK Bingo. Um, it, so, and, and that's on YouTube? Yes. AK Bingo uh, Game Show. Let's see, how do we find um, it? So this is going back now. AK Bingo. AKB48 Sexy Appeal. Uh, from six months ago. Bug Blowing Contest? <laughs> yep, that's the one. Uh, I just typed in all one word. A for Alpha, K for Kilo, Bingo. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, no full episodes, just lots of clips. But, clips um, yeah, it, it gives you a, a very quick taste. Wow. Okay, so as of two months ago, uh, it has 395 episodes. Oh, my God, that's insane. And everything's always spanning out into the next thing. So it's it's almost like... It's like Josie and the Pussycats in a way. You know, they'll be the main game show. And then some contrivance and a lot of adverts for the latest single. And a bit like Muse, they'll break the girls up into different combinations and each one's always releasing a new single. Mm. And it's always about the merits of hand-holding mm. and friendship and trying your best. Like every bloody Japanese pop song ever. Um... Uh, yeah, and it usually sort of culminates every now and again in a quote-unquote live musical number. Usually in front of a lot of like horny older Japanese <laughs> men. It's just, it's weird and creepy and uncomfortable and utterly brilliant. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, I've just been so I've, I've been looking uh, at that at all the uh, all the results on YouTube that that, that comes up when you put in AKB uh, AK Bingo. One one of the results of people also watched is <laughs> is called experiment lava versus frog. <laughs> it, it can, it's just what what even is the internet these oh, days? It's, yeah, I don't know. Uh, thankfully, the frog is dead. It seems to. Say. I'm not watching the video because I'm not I'm not that way inclined. Um, but in the summary, it does say the frog is dead. And to experiment to see if the frog is ripe or not. <laughs> <laughs> Where does the lava come into this? <laughs> They're just going to pour lava over a frog. That's the extent of it. It, it has, has 1.8 million views and is five and a half minutes long from a channel called Experiment Entertainment. <laughs> that sounds like Look Around You. Do you remember that show? Mm, I do, yeah. yeah. Uh. Thanks, ants. Ants. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Frankly, though, all you need to do is watch that one memorable clip from the film Volcano, and you know you you've seen one person melting, you've seen everything melting. Mm. Uh, that scene has stuck with me since I first saw that film, aged ten, maybe nine. That was one of those films the, that was just always on ITV back in the day. Um, really, I've only ever so. watched it once, and literally caught the last thirty seconds of it about two years ago. Um, but I'll never forget the the um, maintenance railway worker who <laughs> jumps into the lava in order to throw the girl onto the train and then stands there as he melts from the shins up. <laughs> I mean, there were two, weren't there? Because it was like a, um, a Armageddon deep impact mm. situation. It wasn't the volcano and uh, the one with Dante's Pierce Peak. Dante's Peak, yeah. that's the one. That's the one. Yeah, but, I really like Dante's Peak. Mainly because it's got Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> that's the one I was thinking of. It, it wasn't Volcano that was always on ITV. It was Dante's Peak. Yeah. yeah, Dante's Peak's the one when the granny gets charbroiled in the lake while they sing Row, Row, Row Your Boat. <laughs> yes, that's right. Oh, my <laughs> God, you're right, yeah. It's Again, but you're right, because that's one of those scenes that, as a kid, just is absolutely horrifying mm. um, because of the... Uh, it's just... The, it's the innocence fit i think isn't it when you when, when you're mm. a kid you're even more or i was certainly i was more affected by the idea of of a totally innocent person um who doesn't know what's happening you know uh kind of experiencing um terrible situations or even being killed mm. and and like you say that <laughs> yes i've just had this crazy flashback of this poor old woman because uh, <laughs> isn't, isn't she like in a boat as the uh, the, the water's bubbling around her or something that's like that. right it's yeah like... the, the boat is somehow melting the, yeah the and, then she, and then she has to get oh my god yeah it's all coming back to me it's horrifying yeah. and then she had and then because the boat's um sinking because it's too hot mm. she has to get in the water doesn't she and try to try to make a way to shore and it just it just erodes her that's but she, she's pushing the boat and everyone else is like leaning out the boat like grandma no get back in the boat yeah that's it 
Oh my god! It, it's it's literally. I think it's about like two foot to shore. They could have jumped out the boat or just let it bob its way to the bank. She achieves nothing. If anything, she probably slows the boat down for a couple of seconds. <laughs> I can't believe. I cannot believe how that's just popped into my head after all this time. You just saying grandma being bowled alive in a lake. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, I do remember that. <laughs> It's just one of those things, you know? The movie oh. where the grandma boils. Oh, Dante's Peak, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. That and dead squirrels. Yeah, the squirrels dying of sulfur poisoning and boiled grandmas. So, let's... So um... we found tonight's episode's name. <laughs> <laughs> so Dante's Peak. Um, that was... Yeah, literally. Literally the same year. How is that mm. possible? Again. Wow. Well, half the time it's because um, someone will go with a, a script to one of the, the studios and they'll say, no, we're not doing that. Mm. But they'll keep the idea and get someone to turn the script around. Uh, that's what they did with, oh, with Jedi Move. Um, I think it was Coming to America. Some some guy went to Paramount, I think it was, and said, uh, here's, here's my script. You can have it for fifty dollars, and they said we're not paying you for that. <laughs> we'll pay our own guy twelve thousand dollars to rewrite your script, and then market it. Muha ha ha ha! Mustache twirl, mustache twirl. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's just one of those situations. But you're right; it it, uh, it must have preceded Armageddon and Deep Impact. I think they were ninety eight, weren't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think, I think seem to remember being ninety seven. I don't know. I'll have a look. Um, yeah. So a, a, a nice fun game, as we always try and do in these situations. Which one do you think has the better IMDb score? Volcano or Dante's Peak? Oh, I'm going to say Dante's Peak because it's more memorable. Mm. And it's got Pierce Brosnan in it and more set pieces. Pierce Brosnan is automatically a 0.5 extra, I think, on the scale. Isn't mm. it? But, yeah, um, Tommy Lee Jones, not so much after Batman Forever. Uh, you are correct. Dante's Peak uh, is a 6. And Volcanoes of 5.5. Which one do you think came out first in uh, in 1997? Ooh. I, mm, that's tricky. Volcano feels like a film released by a major studio. You know, it, it's got more sort of bombast to it. Mm. Um, whereas Dante's Peak feels more like... I seem to remember having at, more atmosphere and tension. So it's more sort of art house so i'm gonna go with volcano uh volcano came out in april and dante's peak came out in february so february actually had the jump in that dreaded february um release slot which is a bit strange mm. Mm, universal and um yeah universal v 20th century fox <laughs> which is a bit uh interesting i'm guessing uh, dante's peak was universal dante's peak was uh, Universal, yeah. I don't know why. I just associate that with colours. Fox is red, which was the cover of Volcano, and Dante's Peak was blue, which was generally the colour I associate with Universal. So, that's, there we go. That's fascinating. Good old tisms. That's how my brain works. Yeah, Deep Impact and Armageddon, both 98. Um, Armageddon with a better score. 6.7 to 6.2. I'll agree with that. The only thing I can remember about Deep Impact is... Uh, well, I may be misremembering, but the meteorite falling on President Morgan Freeman's head. <laughs> Does it? I can't even remember that. Yes, the only bit of the film I remember is Morgan Freeman is the president, and he's standing by the beach with his daughter when mm. this, when a chunk of the meteorite hits the ocean and he gets swept away. And Dave Chappelle made a brilliant sketch about it, saying, so <laughs> um, Meteor headed to Earth, black president blamed. <laughs> 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 uh okay you've got me uh you got me intrigued now let's see uh what's what's ranked as the best disaster movies of all time shall we so this is fictionhorizon.com um ba -ba 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 -ba. let's go for the top 10 they've got a top 50 but we'll go for the top 10 oh this is an interesting one straight off the bat titanic not <laughs> not not what i was expecting uh, I thought about a disaster flick. Would you? Okay, all right. I'm yeah, think, it's, I'm it's thinking, technically a natural disaster. I suppose so. Uh, nine is Everest. Jesus Christ, did that come out really? seven years ago? I, oh that's God. not a disaster film. God. That's that's the um, 
the semi-autobiographical tale of a band of retards that decide to climb Mount Everest with poor <laughs> equipment. <laughs> I've actually read the book that that was half based on, um, mm. uh, Into Thin Air. Yeah, uh, which is which is a fascinating read. Would 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 highly recommend it. Um, I'd consider that more of a disaster flick than um, the Titanic, personally. But it's just people climbing a mountain. A disaster flick has to be like the environment is fucking them over rather well, than is, them cause, cause tracking gold. Well, it is because there was a storm. There was an unexpected storm on, ah, the, uh, on, on the summit, okay. and that's what happened. They uh, they, oh, they, they thought that. they had clear air to climb it, and um, and then this storm this storm came in and obliterated everyone, wiped everyone out. They were just looking in the wrong direction from the top of the mountain. <laughs> Into Thin Air would be a great title for Wile E. Coyote's autobiography. Ah, I like it. Yeah. Well done. I like that. Uh, number eight is Twister, that old um, Bill classic. Paxton classic. The one with the cow. And Helen Hunt? It is Helen Hunt, yeah. Yeah. Uh, she sort of she had that voice, didn't she? The kind of... Um... Sort of like she was chewing something all the time. I liked it. I found Helen. Yeah, I like it. There's something ar- uh, arousing. There's something oddly arousing. Yeah, I mean, she's the height of an average mother, which is always a plus <laughs> in any woman. Sexual appeal. She's um. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how to best describe it. Um, I suppose clearly called... you never saw Mad About You because that immediately kills her sex appeal. No, I watched Mad About You as uh, as, as a kid. Yeah, sure. No, she's 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 kind of like the girl next door grown up into a, a mother. <laughs> this is something yeah. oddly the girl oddly next door's mother. <laughs> yes, yes, the next door's yeah. mother. Ah, <laughs> oh, but not quite in the same way as Stacey's mom by Phantoms of Wayne. <laughs> well, the different types of alluring, I guess. Yeah, mm. that video was really unsettling. That uh, we've probably talked about it in the past, but that music video literally ends with a fourteen, fifteen-year-old boy. Jacking it off in the bathroom, Stacy walking in on him, thinking that he's wanking over her and not her mother, and then touching her heart in a sort of like he's doing that for me. And then the mo- uh, then the video ends. <laughs> Never seen it. It wasn't a a song that uh, that yeah I got into. Oh, it, it's not about the song. It's about the video. Go check the video out, Dan, and find out why everyone remembers the video. <laughs> That's one of those things of, like, well, just watch, just watch porn. Why would you watch a yeah, music video to get? Could be. Well, get this around. was back in the day before we had porn. You know, back in the early two thousands. Was it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let me look. Oh, this is this is the benefit of of doing these hangouts and just having something else playing in the background that I uh, exactly. Can... Oh, twenty ten. It's like after we. Oh no, sorry, that that's a film. No, that'd been the upload because it. I think no. it's about two thousand. Three. It was when the <laughs> it was the time when we had the Japanese oh, exchange three. student was, living yeah. with us. <laughs> That's why I remember it being fixed in that period of time because we had Hiroki living with us. I don't think you've ever told that story on this show. I think that. How um... I not? The period where, in order to integrate ourselves with a very shy Japanese foreign exchange student, we watched a lot of uh, the box and played Sonic Raid, uh, Sonic Raiders, mm. because Sonic's Japanese, right? <laughs> <laughs> and after about the second night he never came out of his room again until the fortnight was over oh bless him that must be difficult yeah do you do you, do you see that as a missed opportunity now um all these years later with your um fondness of the of the of the country of japan and its culture oh absolutely yeah age 15 16 no 15 was definitely not the right time to have a very quiet shy japanese teenager living in my attic <laughs> but i can look back now and see it as the great missed opportunity of my life um how did that happen then i honestly don't know <laughs> but for some reason our secondary school had a foreign exchange program and i was only made aware of it when mum said oh yeah and the students coming to live with us tonight what why am I going back to school at seven in the evening? Who is this person? What the fuck is going on? Why have you agreed to this? And to this day, I have never found out which of my parents was responsible for the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing story. My God. Yeah. And, and you just dumped him in the attic? D- d- he, he went there pretty much. When it wasn't the <laughs> attic, it was the spare bedroom. It just feels like the attic. It's funnier in my mind. That he was in he the went attic. there. He just crawled <laughs> up into the attic and, and refused to come out. 
the thing I remember was the first weekend. Um, it was a case of like, okay, what do we do that's sort of like, welcome to England, quintessentially British. And we took him to the Cosford Air Museum. <laughs> Yep, these are the planes that helped us win World War II. <laughs> that was one of Dad's incredible lack of foresight moments. Do they teach you much about World War II over in Japan? Um, no, but uh, it probably gave they, a good they indication they of what they who, lost. Who the Japanese align themselves with and, you know, all the atrocities? <laughs> Quite possibly. You know, oh, you know, the other thing, um, back in the time as well dad's a massive um, fan of the spitfires in general and we have a lot of paintings of spitfires around our house more oh, so okay. no less so than we used to have but it must have been really really weird for this japanese kid with a legacy of <laughs> defeat still hanging over generations of uh, of japanese people coming into a house that's just full of british war machines do you think then, oh, so, wow. sorry very quickly do you mm. think that there is a band called the Spitfires? Yes, there has to be. Yes, there is. They're from Watford. Anyway, um, yeah, that's. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh, I want to. I want to hear. Uh, what did you say his name was? Hiroki. Hiroki. Well, it might have been Hiroki. I just. You were just Hiroki. too ignorant to learn it. <laughs> He's a Western swine that I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I, I was thinking early today that everything that's interesting about my life is all past tense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I need to change that up. I need to I need to get into a, some school exchange programs and adopt me some foreign exchange students for a week. Well, I mean, that's the benefits of, you know, getting older and, and having your own... <laughs> just, just turning up to school. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Who have you got? <laughs> have you got any foreign exchange programs coming up that I can get on in, on board with, perchance? It doesn't well, fortunately, I, I have my mum's endless capacity to uh, to try and do good deeds, and my dad's complete stubbornness to do something completely stupid and idiotic. So ah. the combination of the two, it ties in quite well. <laughs> have you ever told of the time my dad got in a fight with the postman? No, but, but please do. Uh, this was when we had the porch put in. And um, so packages could just be like left in the porch, much simpler than, than pushing them through the mailbox and, and breaking things, as was the style at the time. Mm. And uh, the, the new postman we had on duty had a tendency to push things through the letterbox instead and, you know, risk breaking them rather than just leaving the door open. And Dad had left a note out, I think the previous day, saying, look, please just don't. just The door is open. Just leave them there, please, for the love of God. And I had a friend over at the time, and Dad was working from home in the kitchen, and we were we were just sort of uh, killing time downstairs playing video games, and we hear the uh, the letterbox do its whole like drag scrape clatter, and then Dad shouting from the other side of the house, right, and then the sound of the chair angrily scraping back in the kitchen, thudding footsteps. Dad flings open the door, walks into the middle of the street, and has a blazing argument with a postman that almost ends in blows. <laughs> <laughs> and then that postman got transferred from uh, from our street like the day after. Wow, I can imagine. Yeah. It's like I'm, I'm not I'm not doing my sacred duty of delivering mail to that house. Are you kidding? Mm. Postmen take their <laughs> jobs extremely seriously. Yes, my dad is a scary man when he wants to be. <laughs> Many of his explosive temper and irrationality, which I oh. have, uh, you know, graciously as the first son adopted. <laughs> Well, that's how it's supposed to go. Yeah. yeah. Um, number seven, Geostorm. I feel as though, I don't know who's made this list, but uh, they seem to really enjoy the shit disaster movies. Um, mm, that's Gerard Butler, isn't it? That's a Gerard Butler one that everyone said is, is, is horrendously poor. Mm. Um, and that's for a Gerard Butler fan And that is that is for a Gerard Butler film, yeah. Um, Please say the remaining six are all Gerard Butler films. <laughs> it's just it just Gerard Butler's career qualifies as a disaster movie. <laughs> it truly does. <laughs> um, five point three Geostorm on IMDb, so that's uh, wow. Maybe one for uh, for the uh, reviews and retrospectives one of these days. Oh, there's an idea. Yeah, we could have like Gerard Butler month or something. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Contagion. I haven't seen it. But um, uh, I'm aware of it because it was suddenly trending again in 2020 for yeah, no they... 2019 for reasons unknown. Mm. Um, is that the one with 
Kate Winslet as well, or am I thinking of a different one? I think so. Doesn't it also have, um, I want to say, Matt Damon? Yes, it does. Matt Damon, yeah. Lawrence Fishburne, Marion Cotillard. Cotillard? Cotillard. That would be saying. Number five, The Impossible. Oh, I suppose. I seem to remember that one. Oh, oh that was the one with the flood, wasn't it? That was the tsunami in um, yeah, it's, uh, it's the, Indonesia. Yeah, it's a real story. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I caught the end of that. It was so twee and saccharine, it made me angry. Um, there's um, there's a scene where they're all sitting together in the relief centre and um, the, the mother's been separated from the family and, you know, there's the, the down and out family, the now orphaned kids, the, uh, the, the typical uh, overweight but incredibly helpful black woman. Um, and, um, yeah, they're just all trading sob stories. And then it's like, I just wish I knew I could, you know, find my protagonist husband in all of this. And the, the merry band of survivors all chip together and give her the last of their phone credit so that she can have a tearful phone call with her husband, who I'm pretty sure is quite safe and possibly might even have been Ewan McGregor. It is. And they're all like crying on her behalf. And it was just like, oh, it was so sickeningly revolting. Well, it qualifies, as, it qualifies as being the fifth best disaster movie of all time, according to Fiction Horizon. Maybe the disaster side of it's good, but the, the second half of the film is, is just unwatchable. Mm. That's the impossible part, number watching the movie to completion. <laughs> number four is Gravity. Uh, okay, which yeah, I, Speed 4, technically. Yeah. I've st I my God, that was 2013, and I still haven't seen it. Jesus, so that, that was one of those films that I was looking forward to seeing, and uh, just somehow the years go by. Um, Mind you, you still haven't seen Lair of the White Worm, and that was 1988, 1983. Yeah, 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 that was... Uh... Yeah, you, you call yourself a Ken Russell fan. <laughs> I bet you've not even seen the BFI extended cut of Devils from 1971 yet. I haven't, I haven't, It's but it's on my uh, shelf as the next thing I do need to watch, so... <laughs> we'll put it right after Fifth Shades of Grey and Leon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the Ken, the Ken Russell season is coming. <laughs> God, that'll be a great way to completely alienate any fan base that we had holding on by this point. Have you have you heard of the Wave? Number three is the Wave from 2015. I think it's a foreign language film. The Wave depicts the life of a Norwegian geologist mm -hmm. when the Akonisset uh, crevice crumbles in Moor of Romsal. It creates a vast avalanche that leads to a tsunami. Uh, this terrorizes the citizens and causes massive destruction. That uh, makes it sound like the tsunami okay. is sentient. Well, who says they're not? Well, that's true, like uh, Chaos from the Sonic Adventure. Oh, well, exactly. That is something yeah. that, uh, that... That is an idea that needs to be explored, the idea of uh, sentient natural disasters. I think that's... that's, that's is that not just Spider-Man Far From Home? No, because... With the uh, elementals. Oh, I completely forgot about that aspect to it. But mm. but that's all just a uh, spoilers for Far From Home, isn't it? That's just a ploy by um, Mysterio, isn't it? So it's it true. Really count. But in the very literal sense, they are sentient natural disasters. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, I suppose if you look at something like Hercules as well, there were the um, the Titans. The Titans. Yeah, they were and the Cyclops. <laughs> <laughs> Rock. Ice, fire, wind, cyclops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number two, deep water horizon. Oh god, these are really boring. That was the one with the oil rig, wasn't it? This is definitely this is definitely been uh, penned by someone taking the piss. Number one is Greenland. <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> I've not even heard of Greenland. It's another Gerard it's... Butler. <laughs> oh, is that about the? Uh... No, it was the. Iceland, where the volcano went off in two thousand nine. It's, it's about eight? a comet that's that's again. It's it, a comet is hurtling towards Earth, and um, and it's going to destroy the entire planet except for Greenland uh, for some reason. <laughs> so so uh, the call cries out that everyone needs to get to Greenland. It's like the the only safe space in 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 the world, and so it's Gerard Butler and his family's uh, last ditch attempt to to get there, which is very much, I suppose, when you think about it, what twenty twelve is. Um, I was going to say, why did 2012 not make the list? Or Day After Tomorrow? Or, well, no, um, just, 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 the, San Andreas. just the plot of 2012 is, I think they have to get to the uh, Himalayas, don't they? Because mm. the Himalayas are... Uh, oh, no, there's a there's a ship in the Himalayas. That's why. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Isn't it the original arc? Or do they build an arc? 
they build. Or am I partially confusing this one. with Evan Almighty? Yes, I think you, you're confusing it. Yeah, they build one. They they build an arc in the in the Himalayas, and mm. uh, and the world ends. It's it's oh god, that film's so amazing. Uh, the world ends, um, and the, these small groups of people survive, and they <laughs> they frame the ending as this really triumphant moment, kind of glossing over the fact that seven billion people have just been wiped. Yes, everyone is dead. <laughs> oh, and there's I can't remember if it's a deleted scene or not, but um, again they get a phone call of one of the characters like Grandma, you made it too. <laughs> And somehow my dog, who died nine years ago, <laughs> he's just bringing it's such oh. a forced happy ending. It's, yeah, yeah. That's I, the one where the entire thing happens because the neutrinos mutate, like the, a base element of the universe suddenly decides to up and mutate for no good reason. No, I thought I thought twenty twelve was just because the Earth was fighting back or something like that. I thought that was the only reason they gave. They, they were looking into the center of the Earth and like the Earth is changing. Uh, no, it's because the neutrinos are mutating. Okay, all right. Okay, I didn't, I didn't realize. That. Oh, what about? Do you remember the core? Uh, well, do you want me to um, to go through the list and try and find some of the uh, some of the more recognizable ones? Um, yeah, let's find some of the uh, the also rounds. Considering that Greenland was number one. Okay, so you've got 127 hours at 50, which is James Franco. What? That, I know. I don't think that counts as a disaster movie, but uh, but there we go. Uh, Day of the Earth Stood Still, Keanu Reeves at 48. But not the original. No. Well, actually, yeah, g given by the top 10, yeah. <laughs> 28 weeks later at 47. I mean, even, yeah, it's, 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 it's ridiculous because how can you say that 28 weeks later is a lesser film than Greenland? Uh, you could say it's a lesser disaster movie because it's, you know, Greenland is specifically a disaster movie, but you can't say that it's a, it's a better movie. Um so that's a bit strange. Mm. Um, Earthquake, Charlton Heston, 1974, 45. Oh, classic. Yeah, classic. Yeah. That's a good one. Arachnophobia is not a disaster movie. This list is stupid. It's um, it's the disaster of spiders, which is what you call, you know, a anything that's more than one spider is a disaster <laughs> of spiders. A disaster. Like a murder of crows. Uh, Dante's Peak at 39. Oh, bullshit. Yeah. Uh, Outbreak at 36. I, I mean, that's a classic as well, Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. Uh, from 95. That's what Contagion was based on, I think, actually. Yeah, the one with the monkey, isn't it? Yeah, that's the one. And 28 Days Later based on it as well. Oh, oh is it? Towering Inferno, another classic at 34. Yeah. God, this list oh, is... Oh, Poseidon Adventure. Poseidon Adventure's got to be in there somewhere. I think... It w I, I should hope it is. Um, all right, scrolling down. 12 Days of Christmas. What the hell? <laughs> um, and to be fair, that is a disaster movie. Hmm. War of oh, the Worlds that reminds in 26. Um, do you remember last year we were talking about A Christmas Story? You finally got around to watching it. Oh, I, I saw it a few years ago. I tried to watch it again, and I absolutely hated it the second time. Well, guess what's getting a Disney Plus show with the original stars. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh <my laughs> so God. we're going to have to find a way of watching that Santa Claus TV show when they come out, and oh, then oh. having uh, a sort of Cobra Kai fight-off between the two of them. Yeah. Oh, I'm definitely up for that. Yeah. I... Well, it's because the Americans love it so much. It's it's mm. the quintessential Christmas film. Um, it's like the Mr. Bean Christmas episode over here. Mm. Well, no. But yeah, sure. Uh, Volcano yeah. at 24. Mm. The Core at 23. The Day After <laughs> Tomorrow at 22. This is just a, offensive. Go. This is offensive to the, to the idea of lists. Um... <laughs> Uh, Independence Day at 20. Independence Day is an amazing film. Well, I mean, half of it's amazing, and then the second half isn't, but still. Yeah, the second half, that's trash. Cloverfield at 19. But that's probably an Emmerich general, really, isn't it? Mm. Cloverfield isn't a disaster movie. It's a rampaging monster movie. It's, it's a creature feature. Dawn of the Dead at 17, the Snyder version. Deep Impact Ugh. at 16, Armageddon at 15, Poseidon Adventure 14. Oh, that's... Bullshit. It's got Pompeii. Which of the event? Pompeii at thirteen. Oh my god, that's a that's <laughs> a lost Paul W S Anderson movie that we need to we need to do. Oh, it is, and it's got um. Oh shit, uh, who's it? That guy that kept trying to make famous. Um, Kit, wasn't he the one from Avatar? Kit Harrington. No, no, you're right. Kit Harrington. Kit Harrington's in it. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Um, Oh, it's, you've got uh, Kiefer Sutherland as well. <laughs> as, yes. As, as the, oh, uh, how have we never Roman watched Emperor. this? 
<laughs> oh, right, definitely. Okay, I'm, I'm checking Netflix now to see if it's on there. That's definitely going on the list. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize Carrie Kit Anderson. Harrington, why is he a thing? Is it just people... Is he in things ironically? I think he got a Game of Thrones bump, and um, I think that's definitely dissipated since uh, since the, the last season was, was, you know, received so poorly. I think Kit Harrington now is mainly a, a theatre actor. Uh, I don't think you'll see him too much in... Oh, yep. Anything else? Pompey's on uh, on Netflix. Oh wow! Perfect. Um, five point five on MDB. So I mean, you know, it's better than Twilight. <laughs> so they say. <laughs> I personally oh, don't believe that. Dreams. Um. Yeah. Oh, I'm excited to watch Breaking Dawn Part One. Yes. Yeah. That's tomorrow night. I'm I'm amazed mm. that we missed that when we went through all of. Uh, Paul W. Anderson stuff. How do we miss Pompeii? Well, it just doesn't feel like a Paul Anderson film. You know, mm. it's not. Um, it's not a. I don't know what you call his genre. Sort of horror, light horror, Hor uh, action, action, action horror. I guess. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, he did it in between Retribution and the final chapter. So that was his palate cleanser. Oh, perfect. Yeah, it's like, okay, we need to get something really boring done so I can get all my worst habits in this movie and then focus on all the fun stuff in this one. Actually, he did... Um, he, he does a film in between all the Resident Evil films he directed. So he did The Three Musketeers as well. That's a pile of crap that we... So he did. ...that we haven't touched on. Ooh, does this mean that Milia Jokovic is in The Three Musketeers and Pompeii? I can't see her in Pompeii. Bear with me. You see her in anything? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I can't see her in the in the in the cast list. Uh, oh, I see what you mean. Uh, I'm Kit Harrington, through. Emily Browning. Oh, she was in the she was in the Return to the Lagoon. And oh, of course, Hellboy 2019. That's a pile of shit. Um, Milly Jokovic was. Yeah, it's Jokovic? it's one of the worst. The um the, the remake of Hellboy from three years ago. Yeah, I didn't realize she was it, in that. Beyond awful, plays the uh, the villainess. Um. Well, yeah. I mean, we'll we'll be doing a Paul W. S. Anderson, um, uh, month at some point, just to help with your, um, uh, withdrawals the from hunt. from the from the Resident Evil series. Mm. After all this time, and I, I know how much you're still struggling to to adapt after life. Genuinely, I am. Yeah, we're we're trying so badly. Well, what have we got? Really capturing it. We've got um. Um, Mortal Kombat, obviously. Um, we mm -hmm. have uh, Event Horizon. Uh, we have Alien vs. Predator. Monster Hunter. I'm, oh, try yeah. I'm trying to do it chron chronologically here, Matthew. Oh, chronologically. My bad. Um, Alien Predator Death Race, oh. which is Jason Statham. Oh, Jason Statham, yeah. 2005 ish? 2008. Uh, oh. Never seen that. Um, yeah, Three Musketeers, Pompeii. And then Monster Hunter, so um, quite a few to go out there. It's a hell of a gap. Yeah. Did you Did you know that Paul W. Sanderson is six foot three? Really? I didn't know that. Some interesting oh. uh, little trivia there. Um, Maybe that's why he's been able to succeed so long. It's like when his his films are shit, but have you met him? He's quite tall. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah we'll give him the bazillion billion dollars to make a, another franchise crash and burn. I mean, you'd, you'd imagine that that might be how it works, sure. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, Pompeii's at number 13 on this list, which is uh, mm. incredible. San Andreas at 12. Um, That's then... the one with... Uh, what's her name? The, the really attractive one who's in, like, what sort of new girl? Alexandria Daddario? That's the one, yeah. yes. That's with the only the, thing I know it for. With the very intense blue eyes. Yes, that's her, yes. And only the piercing blue eyes. That's yes. all anyone ever really focuses on. Absolutely. Um, and then Cold Zone at number 11. I've never heard of Cold Zone. Hmm. Hmm. You uh, ever heard of a movie, uh, a movie called Frozen? But not that movie called Frozen. But the not other movie Frozen. called Frozen. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think I have. It's got the kid who played Iceman. I'm not sure he's probably in his late 40s. And it's him... And two friends go to a ski resort, and they uh, they hop aboard the chairlift, 
and then uh, it turns out they're the last ones on there for the day. But it's not just the day. It's a long weekend and the whole resort is shut down and they're trapped on this um, <laughs> chairlift <laughs> overhanging a precipice. I, I kid you. You know, I I, thought, I was really absorbed by the whole thing. Um, and it just gets worse and worse and worse when, you know, they take more and more extreme measures to try and get off this fucking chairlift. And I'm pretty sure wolves turn up. I'm almost oh, positive. Oh, wow. I, I may have watched it cl too close to the grey, but I am almost certain that wolves arrive on the scene at one point. But there's one really harrowing scene where... Um, they fall asleep in the night and the girl has taken her gloves off and her hand is gripping the bath uh, and when she wakes up she's got to peel oh, like no. three layers of skin off to get the bath it's it's been 10 years since i saw it and uh, that has stuck in my mind it's grotesque um is sean ashmore the troll song <laughs> is that who you think yes that's him Iceman. yeah 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 um no cold zone sounds even better than that it's got a 3.6 on IMDb <laughs> in the uh, el 11th best disaster movie of all time. A storm is coming. No one could predict it. No one can measure it. Now one family must survive it. You can't come in from the cold. Wow. And Why can't the rest of the family survive it? That's 2017. Uh, yeah. Looks good. Wow. Does, um, I mean, does Sharknado count? I mean, you'd have thought so. The, they've kind of been yeah. very loose with the definition of a disaster movie, so mm. so I don't see why not. Yeah, I mean, the, when I think disaster movie, I think sort of a natural cause of events, but they've got several zombie movies in there. Well, that's what I would have said. I'd, contagions. I'd have gone more along the line. In fact, they don't even have 2012 in this in this list, do they? Come to think of it. Huh. Yeah. I, I consider a disaster movie... The Earth Fights Back. That would be my definition. So, like, twist, mm. Twister? Is, was Twister in this? Uh, yes, it was. It was, yeah. okay. Um, okay. Of course, because we were talking about Helen Hunt and Bill Paxton. Mm. Uh, it's, surely there's another Twister movie. <laughs> that um, there is. There is one. Um, Bruce there. Campbell's in it for, like, the first two minutes and then immediately immediately gets killed. When, um, when I was in Canada, there was a video rental shop, a literal video rental shop. Uh, and we uh, we just went and, and picked films based on genres, pretty much, or actors. And uh, it was just like, oh, this film's got Bruce Campbell on it, and so is this one. We'll take these. And uh, one of them was really good about a, a boarding school full of witches where the, the joke is that his character isn't allowed to speak for, like, 80% of the movie until finally he can be Bruce Campbell at the end. And the <laughs> other one is a, a hurricane movie where... They all go on down to the storm cellar, but then he's the dad and he gets sucked out through the barn doors and he's gone from the movie and ended off shortly thereafter. Sucked out through the barn doors sounds like a kind of, you know, euphemism. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's the name of your sex tape. <laughs> on a farm. Um, <laughs> Where were you sucked out? On a farm! <laughs> Uh, um, so CBR.com otherwise known as comic book resources back in the day have done their 10 best disaster movies um, so this is possibly a little bit more legitimate um, so their editor's choice at number one is Contagion Happening? no Contagion oh. um, although The Happening that would be a natural disaster, it uh, disaster film. Yeah, yeah it's all about the trees getting their own back hmm uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and Jude Law were the two names in that that we missed. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a great photo of Gwyneth Paltrow on the poster if you happen to ever <laughs> check it out. She looks, she she doesn't look happy. I'm gonna have a look now. Um, Armageddon number two. I mean, I, I'd accept that. I'd accept oh, Armageddon. I'd agree with that. Yeah. Um, Geostorm. At no wow, everyone's pushing Geostorm. Everyone's I think. loving that. Geostorm. Maybe might it's be... so bad it's good. Maybe now that, you know, time has settled down, people can see it for the unintentional comedy that it is. Yeah. Um, but in true disaster film form, Geostorm is full of heart-pumping moments that give viewers an entertaining way to spend the evening. Due to the quality directing, storyline, and cast, the film is worth a watch. Uh, okay, all right. Mm. Let's, um, let's double-check that on IMDb. I have a feeling I already did, but I'm just going to do it again. Um, Geostorm 2017, Jared Butler. Yeah, oh, yeah, I did. 
<laughs> uh, can you think of a more sort of passive, you can give this one a skip, than worth a watch? Say that again, It sorry? just sounds so, in terms of just, um, what I'm trying to say, it's sort of like the, yeah, it's all right, worth a watch. It, it just feels like it's not really worth watching at all. If you literally have nothing else to do. Oh, I see what you mean. Then it's worth a watch. Yeah, it, it seems... Given all the... It, it's not something that would ever inspire me to watch a movie, even if I had nothing else going on. Yeah, well, I mean, given all the quality films out there and, and other stuff mm. that you could potentially be doing, I suppose so, yeah. Although that, that usually doesn't stop us, does it? <laughs> we watch <laughs> so much shit. We go above and beyond. <laughs> uh, the Poseidon Adventure number four. Yeah, I can't mm -hmm. argue with that. Crawl, number five. Oh, okay. This looks like something that you can get on board with. Um, Crawl? It's called Crawl. It's from 2019. Oh, the one um, with the crocodiles? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good fun. Ah, I, I thought you'd seen it. Yeah, it's from the guy that did um, uh, High Tension or Switchblade Romance and oh, right. produced by Sam Raimi. It's a lot of fun. Oh, okay. Yeah, Alexandra Azure or something. As, and, is, is yeah. the director. Um, Haley That's Keller. That's absolutely worth watching. Haley Keller, which is too similar to Helen Keller for my eyes, just reading, <laughs> reading it from this far back. <laughs> um, learns that a Class 5 hurricane is headed towards Florida. She plans to leave the state, but first she wants to check on her father. She check Oh, that's always the case. She checks his vacant condo. Mm -hmm. She's unable to locate him. She goes to his... Okay, the, I don't need the full story. Uh, Crawl is an exhilarating and entertaining disaster horror movie that's intended to captivate you for its 87-minute length. Oh, nice. Yeah. And, uh, nice and short. That's like about the same length as Little Mermaid <laughs> or something. Yeah, it's it's the length of two episodes of Buffy, essentially. Oh. You know. Nice. Uh, well, these have Titanic in as well at number six, so I suppose mm -hmm. we'll allow that. Um, Jesus Christ. Do you know how long Titanic is? I didn't realize. It's like three hours. Three hours, 15 minutes. Do you know that the, there's like a, a, an extended cut where you see a good chunk of the film from the iceberg's point of view? And it <laughs> adds like, I don't know, like 50 minutes onto the runtime. <laughs> um, did you know that the, that the iceberg was actually spotted um, in the days after the sinking? And, uh, and there's a very famous photo of it with um, the uh, paint on on the side of the iceberg it's quite it's quite uh, harrowing to to see this photo yeah, that sound quite, uh, i was about to say chilling um hey boom, boom. yeah just unintentional punning but uh yeah that does sound ominous particularly if it's like creeping towards them you know that the iceberg is coming back to get those that dared survive it, <laughs> it <laughs> i love the idea of uh, of the iceberg that that's that struck the titanic being like this um mr Sentient. x type figure <laughs> that just follows. oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> titanic 2 oh wait no there already is a what? titanic 2 isn't it uh, there is a titanic 2 isn't there yeah <laughs> the iceberg's um, revenge do you remember many like specifics of the animals of farthing wood like episodes no, nope. rather than just character nets. No, nope. they were There's... they they were on, but it, it it's strange when you're a kid because you put something on even though you don't want to watch it, and so uh, it was on, but I kind of forced myself out of consciousness if that makes sense. So, sorry, uh... no, that's fine. There's an episode where they're they're having to swim across a river. And oh, I forget the name of the uh, the the debris. Basically, there's this like um, uh, wash wash out of dead trees and uh, and crap from the river, sort of barreling towards them. And as a child, it was one of the most intense and horrifyingly unsettling things. Uh, watching these animals crossing a river and then cutting to a still shot of this almost like a mound, and it had two twigs sticking out of it, and they almost looked like crab claws. And I didn't know at the time what it was. It was just like, what's this weird crab creature coming towards them and this dramatic music playing? And every time we cut to it, there's like a dramatic, ominous sting. And it just keeps getting closer and closer every time we cut back to it until eventually it barrels into Fox. But yeah, as a kid, that scared the absolute shit out of me. It just really unnerved me, the idea that this weird creature is... is, is Plowing inevitably, but uh, but unseen towards our poor heroes. Mm. No, I um, 
No. Don't, don't, don't <laughs> ring any bells. Oh, and what was it that was... What, what, what was this crab-type creature? Yeah, basically, it was just a pile of, like, wood and, and stuff okay. from the river. Uh, like, yeah, stuff that had been washed into the river and did just, like... Yeah, river debris, but it, it piled up and it had these two twi twigs coming out of it, essentially, that made it look like it had, like, reaching monster hands. Mm. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, I'll see if I can find uh, a picture of it and send it to you later. It's, uh, that, that's pretty much identical to my um, my Gizmo Duck story from DuckTales that I've told a few times. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Exactly. Isn't it weird? The most innocuous stuff scares us as kids, but we'll track down stuff like Blair Witch and the Aliens films and love them. <laughs> but uh, piles of dead wood in a river and a man turning into a, a robo ripoff a in duck, duck form. <laughs> duck. And it scars us. <laughs> exactly. Um, this one does give uh, appreciation to twist to, to more appropriate appreciation to twister at number seven. Uh, Everest, the number eight in this one. Alive at number nine. I don't know alive. Alive. Ah. You don't know alive. Oh, it's the one about. Hang on. Uh, oh, it's a rugby alive place. is the one where the plane crash. Yeah, yeah, the plane crash in the mountains and they eat each other. Yeah, that's right. Spoilers. Uh, and then there's daylight. Do you remember daylight? I don't. Uh, it's, uh, oh my god, the butcher bird. I forgot about the butcher bird from Farthing Wood. She being impaled on brambles in a kid show, and they're bleeding Ooh. out. What oh, bird cackles. No. Fucking hell, what a show. Thanks, England and France. Um, uh, what was I talking about before I got distracted by Farthing Wood? Um, <laughs> oh, Daylight, yeah. Uh, Daylight's that film where, I think it's LA, uh, one of those huge underground tunnels. And it collapses at both ends. Uh, I'm pretty sure Sylvester Stone's in it. Yeah. Uh, don't know that one. Oh, sorry, I got distracted there for a second by um, um, nothing. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry. No, it was fine. no, it, it was uh, something on the it, on the um, on the uh, Takeshi's Castle, which we haven't actually mentioned yet. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> Takeshi's Castle's on in the background, <laughs> which was going to uh, be. I've just uh, sent you a. <laughs> so I, I just sent you a screenshot to um, what's it called Telegram, uh, and it's, it's four images of uh, random episodes of Farthingwood. <laughs> ah, okay, check them out in a second. Top five deaths in the Animals of Farthingwood. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone dies in that show. It's it's morbid. People need to check that that out. It's uh, it was an informative show. I think that's why I'm so glib towards death and have no emotional reactions to even the passings of um, close family members it, it's almost like yeah I just had everything wrung out of me from Farthing Wood as a child I, I want that top five death video to be um, like reminiscent to the uh, to the Sonic um, <laughs> hottest oh, yeah. characters <laughs> top ten hottest what is it uh, hot girl heaven the top ten hottest Sonic women yes um, in fact that would make a just <laughs> a, a, an awful, terrible, but absolutely hilarious YouTube channel. Mm. If you were to, if you were to, to take, like, just just make lists of some of the most heinous crimes in, uh, in in human history and do them in that style. <laughs> just coming up at number ten. <laughs> Who had in forced labor camps his own son interned and was so frightening that even in death they wouldn't accept he was dead. At number eight. Joseph Stalin. I mean, <laughs> who else could pull off a uniform this rat and still get the ladies and that mustache? Am I right, guys? <laughs> Number seven. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Oh, um, a magical age. That would yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, we we had a, a long list of um, things to. To, to kind of chat about, didn't we, this, this week? We've kind of gone uh, nearly an hour now just uh, talking the shit about disaster movies and, and whatever else. Um, what have we got to... Um, what have we got that we've kind of had built up over the uh, last week? In fact, there was, there was a lot of stuff I was going to talk about last week that we didn't get to, yeah. and now I can't remember a single thing. Um, so... Um, uh, uh, I seem to remember having a, a rant about Moon Knight, which uh, which got cut off. Oh, yeah, well, that's um, that's in the past yeah. now. That's that's, that's uh, part of Bye -bye. Um, oh, I suppose in terms of new news, before we move on to what's Matt been watching this week, because he has no life, uh, the the latest on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and that whole situation exploding around Disney at the moment. 
I stayed out of it because I just could not be bothered in the slightest to indulge myself with it. I'm, I'm at the point now where I'm, I'm kind of just like, whatever. I'm I'm not going to watch this film. No one's going to watch this film. Probably you're. It's it's like a snake that's eating itself. Just mm. just fine. <laughs> I don't care. Well, how I'm not going to give this a time. Screen the moment. Oh, but but t tell me about it. Um, yeah, yeah, like you say, it's it's not about the film or one of those rants about oh Disney stop rem remaking things. It's the fact that Peter Dinklage has waded into matters, and and spouted us some stuff about this this whole thing is is sick mm. and twisted. You you can't say you're being progressive in your casting term, and then reinforce these stereotypes that dwarfs are just these cave dwelling monsters, and we need to have a conversation about this. It's like no, no one thinks that people with dwarvism are the same as Tolkien-esque dwarfs, Peter. That's that's clearly a hang-up you have. These are two completely separate issues. But I think people with dwarfism, I think actors like Peter Dinklage and Warwick Davis. Um, when I think fantastical dwarfs, I think, oh, a fantasy race of creatures <laughs> that are like proud, strong, noble warriors. I do not confuse you with a proud, strange, noble warrior that's capable of mining so hard you raise a balrog. It's, but he's conflated the two, and he seems to think that the people think that dwarfism and dwarves are the same thing. So now it's like Disney doing a massive sort of backpedal and saying, oh, well, we're, we're having communications now with the, um, the dwarfism community. Apologies if that's not the, the term I, I thought it was. Um, but uh, yeah, we're thinking of potentially making it Snow White and the seven other mythical creatures now. And it's just like, oh, Disney, just just stop. Just please stop. This is this is just embarrassing. And Peter, just yeah, like Kit Harrington, you used to have goodwill, but you are rapidly squandering it. You are rapidly squandering it. Particularly as someone who has capitalised off his dwarfism for uh, for several other oh, movies been and uh, TV successful. shows. Yeah, he wouldn't be. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's a, you know, he's a, a decent enough actor, but it's purely his yeah. situation which has uh, got in the roles he has. I mean, if, if, if you look at his early career, they were all down to the fact that, uh, you know, roles that kind of played fun i suppose of, of, uh, yeah. of, of the dwarfism aspect of it um i think it's just well apart from he uh he cameo in willow he's one of the villagers oh, he really oh hmm. i think i think he's still you won't be as familiar with this but um the joke in elf um where <laughs> will ferrell calls him an elf i don't know if you remember that scene um, vaguely yeah and uh, I, I imagine that that must just be a hang-up that's, that's stayed with him i call me elf one more time then there's you're an elf <laughs> and then 30 Rock as well, where Liz, from the back, when she's going through a baby crazy phase, tussles his hair, thinking that he's a child. <laughs> he's like, what are you doing, Bab? And she's like, oh, uh, I'm hitting on you. And then she has to go through a series of dates with him. But they just don't click at all. But every time she's like in the stage of dumping him, she does something else. It's like it's because I'm a dwarf, isn't it? It's like no, no, that doesn't matter. And they have to keep dragging out the charade, even though they both hate each other and have no chemistry. Every time she tries to end it, based on it, he just goes back to the like, oh well, you're just a racist. And she's like, fuck. <laughs> it's a great episode. Uh, it is, although under his new um, standards, surely that. That, that kind of isn't allowed anymore. That, that, yeah, that'll be coming for Tina Fey soon enough. Yeah. Um, yeah, but anyway, I mean, it's... Listen, if Disney end up being, um, uh, you know, impaled by the, 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 the sword that they themselves sharpened, then, then that's... Uh, that is uh, poetic justice as far as I'm concerned. I don't, truly it is. Do not give a flying F. If um, they want to be held to these standards, oh, fantastic. It just makes it more entertaining for the rest of us. Exactly, yeah. That, well, that's that's the new sport, isn't it, really? We've just accepted the inevitable, so it's just waiting for, for the point where the whole house that they've built collapses around them. Yeah, and you've got to think that it's coming at some point, don't you? Because with how absolutely disastrous, disastrously they've hand, handled literally all of their properties. I can't, yes. think, I can't think of anything that's, that, that people are excited about anymore. Um, people are excited to see The Mandalorian in the book of Boba Fett. Oh, is that is that a thing that's going to happen? Oh, of course it's a thing. Yeah, apparently in the latest episode, Boba Fett's barely in it, and the fans couldn't be happier. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's another one of those things that... Um, 
just just the Star Wars universe to me is is now is like the the MCU insofar yeah. as um, I it's it's become so bloated and irrelevant for just just across the, the spectrum that uh, I don't have a single bit of desire to to to, to keep up to speed like I once did. I mean, yep. I'm the type of person that that once upon a time just I, I even well i mean you know i think we've spoken about this before i wasn't really enjoying agents of shield but i still watched it because i felt as though i had to keep up to date with you know, marvel <laughs> like if, yeah. if if it somehow affects the films or whatever and <laughs> um and just you know i think it's not even that there's that much content i guess i mean it is but it's also the uh, just a generalized fatigue of um, yeah of, of of that universe and i was bored with star wars i think as soon as the credits rolled on the force awakens that that killed everything for me i can't i can't i, I really can't stress how much the force awakens killed any um remaining love i had for for star wars and and that's gonna be strange to people because the force awakens really you serious that but it's so but, fun but, and but so many the good yeah, yeah and um no, I, I, I despise that film, and I think that the series got everything it deserved afterwards. Um, with, uh, yeah, from that point. Um, what were we talking about? Oh, Mandalorian, Book of Boba Fett. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not going to watch it. I, I don't have any. Um, it, no, I, I have some curiosity to watch it, but I am not. <laughs> yeah, it's it's better. You better to watch other people's cover of it because they're providing an entertaining commentary for just really bad shows well i think as well it's it's because um kind of on uh, uh, edging on, on on what i said just a, a second ago i don't care about this universe anymore i feel as though mm. my interest in star wars now is exclusively um the universe that existed before the turn of the millennium Oh no! Um, episode. I'd say Revenge of the Sith, nineteen seventy-seven to two thousand five. I'd say. No, I'm not. No, I, I was. I, I was happy to include the prequels, but with everything that's come since, it's. I, I figure I may as well just dump the prequels as well. Um, really? Yeah. See, for me, it's retroactively increased my. I mean, they're not good films at all, but I. I am at least willing to accept them as another trilogy uh, that's like loosely attached to star wars as opposed to just the sequel trilogy which is just way over there doing its own thing not damaging the brand i think that's the um, kind of that's a, a graduation goggles um yeah situation where uh oh i hated it at the time but now i'm in a different situation i appreciate it more than what it actually was kind of thing and i i can appreciate that that point of view and i could do that if i wanted to but i don't want to i, I didn't i didn't enjoy them at the time i didn't enjoy them at any point afterwards why why would i consider them canon when for all intents and purposes they're only um redeeming um uh points are that they are not the disney sequels <laughs> that's true and the instant memeability of you mcgregor yes oh hello there. And palpatine um Palpatine. And just the yeah. great dialogue. Yeah, I mean, there's there's just so much. That's the thing about the the prequels. They're so enjoyably bad at times. When you wade through all the boring stuff and the bad CGI, and and the the clunky acting, and you get a few nuggets of genuine entertainment out of them, mostly at the film's expense. But at least they're there. But I think this is um comes down to the differing expectations of Star Wars now though as well isn't it is because when those first films came out Star Wars was still seen as the greatest trilogy of all time and yes. so to 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 then be compared with what the what the prequels became was like this you know bastard um uh hu humongous says it yeah <laughs> younger brother kind of thing um mm. And uh, and so, but, but now we have the sequel series, and we have all, you know literally just all the other shit associated with Star Wars. <laughs> Is we've got? I mean, we we, we we reached the point a long, 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 long time ago, where the uh, you just have so much more poor stuff outweighing the quality stuff, and so it's 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 like just 
shoveling shit on top of shit. At this point, it doesn't make the slightest bit of difference um, to the general, um, you know, way in which we envision Star Wars anymore. Does that make sense? Did I, did I explain it that? does. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of shit that bastardizes the franchise, you've been playing Uncharted 4. Oh yeah, good segue. Very good segue. Um, I I do not like this game at all. I I'm I'm just waiting for that moment, the the Force Awakens moment where people come back to this game and and like that really wasn't very good, was it? Um, I'm just I'm just gonna have a quick drink. Mm. Stalling for time, stalling yeah. for time, um, stalling for time for damn. Um, I mean, it's being released, re-released on PC, I think, isn't it? In the next, uh, if, if not now, then over the next few days, week, whatever. So maybe people will go back to it and say, yeah, but what was all that about? Um, mm. Is that Sony's great gambit with Microsoft buying Activision in the last week? It's Sony going, hey, hey, we're doing <laughs> stuff as well. Uncharted 4's coming to Steam. I know it came out six years ago, but, uh, we're but yeah, it was being re-released. Um, that's terrifying as well. It came out six years ago. Um, I am just... It's just so boring. The, the, the opening is so boring. The, the, the story itself is pretty decent. Um, I'm never going to complain about an, an over-the-top treasure hunt where Uncharted's concerned. It's, I mean, it's what the entire thing is built on. Um, but it is the, um... It's the getting there, which is annoying, and Ooh. you know, you know what I realised this time as well playing it is that, I mean, Sam isn't a very good character. He's he's shoehorned in there, um, and doesn't make any sense to the law of Uncharted, and you know, he he is a stain on the relationships between all the other characters, and so so that's well known. But I also just I just don't like his dynamic with Drake, and that's what I realised in in this is they they make him a clone of Drake, and mm. I don't know if you noticed this when you've been playing it. I find them insufferable to listen to when they're bantering. Um, it's Drake in stereo. It is, yeah. And and Nathan Drake is like one of my absolute all time favourite characters. It, well, from the first three games, and that's because there's one of it. Uh, he's the he's the kind of quick-witted, snarky comedy guy that bounces off a straight man, whether it's Sully or whether it's Elena or whether it's um, the um, the Tibetan um, Sherpa guy that doesn't speak any English. You know, if 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 you've got that dynamic, then there's a there's a good uh, recipe there for you know humor that can last because you can you can infuse the serious with the comedic and and things just feel a lot more natural. It's like Drake, uh, Nathan, and, and Sam are, are constantly out to outdo each other, and they're just constantly sniping, uh, snidely barbing, and um, mm. I I just got to the point where I was playing it last night, and I wanted to just turn off, <laughs> you know, <laughs> turn off the audio because I was bored about just mm. the jokes. Well, in inverted commas, jokes yeah. and snark. Yeah, just, as you said. I'm, I'm just like calm it down. I, this is really boring now. The, I mean, as, as well as that, the average Uncharted one to three game, I think was barely. Uh, I think um, like eight eight hours. I, I guess I think. Um, yeah. You can speed run them about the three. Can't uh, yeah, you? yeah. I, well, yeah. I I have speed run all three games. I think in in under two and a half hours. Um, and then it's only when you're playing it for the first time and you're watching all the cutscenes through about, you know, eight mm. hours, something like that. So it's, it's a fair amount of time. Uh, or, oh, sorry, a, a short enough amount of time where you can be in the company of someone and mm. just enjoy it. Because in Chapter 4, it's like 16 hours or something stupid like that, playing the game from uh, from one end to the other. And most mm. of that time is spent in the company of these these two individuals. It's, it's, I'm, it's just so grating, man. It is so grating. It is. And whereas in the first games it felt like um, the, like overlay banter would happen while you were like doing something else. Mm. Whereas in Uncharted 4, it feels like, oh no, the banter is scripted and we have to make sure that you hear all of it yes. before the next scene or, or set piece gets triggered. So you have to traverse all of this space and listen to these two people babbling incessantly. Yeah. Yeah, and then yeah. finally something will happen. Exactly. The best part of that entire game, to my mind, is um, where they finally split Drake and Sam up when you're in Africa, and it's just you and Sully, and you're in the church, and you're climbing the tower and doing puzzles and bantering with Sully, and it's like, ah, 
the first game dynamic again. Mm. And then you got to do a bloody car chase to save Sam and it all sort of comes crashing back. And then you have to do more vehicle segments when you're on the boat and then you're on your own for a bit. It's all well and good. And then you team up with Sam. And it's just constantly sort of giving you a nice moment of reprieve and reminding you what was so good about the first games. And then it's like, here you go. Here's Sam again. Or here's Nadine again. Or here's... Um, who the hell is the main villain? Is it Ralph? Rafe. Rafe. Close. Mm. <laughs> um, the thing is, yeah, Rafe they, they is Rafe, Rafe, all these elements in. Rafe is Rafe's pretty fine. I mean, he's, he's incredibly cliched as a character, but I, I really like him. He's uh, menacing in that kind of you know quiet, sadistic way, and uh, yeah. he has all the elements of 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 being, you know, as I say, cliche, but a good a good cliche villain type to to bounce off of Drake's kind of you know more happy go lucky snarky personality. But it's all of the layers that they just drab onto. Uh, uh, Nadine is is entirely pointless. She's um, she just brings the mood down so so much. I I really like Laura Bailey. I think her, it's really uh, Laura Bailey is the voice actress behind Nadine. She's you know um, if you look at uh, Catherine uh, in 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 the game Catherine. That, that she plays is just I, I, ju I just love her I just love her in that mm. um, and plenty of other games she's been in that's, uh, that you can go on IMDb and check uh, she, I don't think she does a very good accent I'm, <laughs> I'm listening to it thinking mm. I know that you're an Amer you're an American doing a, a South American a South African accent and it's that's all I can think about <laughs> and yeah. and it's it just frustrates me um, <laughs> I, I don't understand especially Naughty Dog of all people when they're, they're on about Maybe this was before their, um, you know, inclusive. It was just on the turning mantra. point, wasn't it? Yeah, mm. but but why they wouldn't just get a South African actress in to to voice it? And um, but it but that to me is is the same with Troy Baker. Troy Baker should in no way be the voice actor for Sam. Sam mm. Sam and Troy's voices are just not not what I would expect from that character. Is that, mm. you know, uh, I think we, we've got used to it now. Steve Buscemi is is what I sort of mentally hear when I see a picture of Sam. I just someone a bit gruffer, I guess. Someone someone that's lived. He's, he spent, you know, all of his life in a in a South American, in a Panamanian prison, for Christ's sake. And he, he doesn't sound any worse for it. He, he looks worse for it, but he doesn't sound worse <laughs> for it. And that was one of the things that, that Troy Baker got so Wesley well. Snipes. <laughs> yes, he's, he's had such a hard, hard life. He's gone black. <laughs> um, one of the things that, that Troy did so well with Joel from The Last of Us was that it sounded like a guy who'd lived a hundred lifetimes and was just mm. so out of it. But because, uh, with the greatest of respect, Neil Druckmann has the storytelling abilities of a uh, goldfish. Um, it's, it's no, actually, no, 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 no. Sorry, 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 Neil. I take that back. He has the storytelling capabilities of modern day Joss Whedon, which is, <gasps> which is, uh, you know, witty banter, witty banter, witty banter, and that's and that's it. You know, he. I wouldn't say the storytelling abilities of modern day Joss Whedon. The modern day PR interview capabilities of Joss Whedon. Well, I think I think the characters are pretty much the same as well. They're all just witty bantering off of each other, and. Um, and and that was great when you know 20 well in Joss Whedon's case 20 years ago 25 years ago when he still had a semblance of artistic integrity um and and wasn't as high up his own arse if you look at Buffy the, the Buffy dialogue I think is still amazing between because you had a, a, a variety of characters all coming together and it was just uh, um just the 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 fusion of these different personalities that came together to create some outstanding moments if you if you look at um you know what he's done recently uh, even even something like firefly to an extent i mean firefly kind of i can see it i can see now it getting to the point of him thinking like my god i'm really good at this uh, scripting business yeah aren't I? this is my start yeah but firefly still um is is restrained enough in places to to allow character to dictate dialogue um mm. and then it, it just went off the rails and this is how i feel i, I think neil Druckmann actually wrote uh, co-wrote with, with someone else and charted for and it is yeah. it's like you can you can see you can see the the points where they thought oh yeah now now have them say a joke and so they just it's just joke that'll be funny and then it just doesn't stop it doesn't end and it's oh it's so boring and um 
It's yeah. what I maintain why the Lost Legacy works. Um, it somewhat saves Nadine, it somewhat saves Sam. Um, it's always good to hear uh, Claudia Black as um, Chloe. Mm. And yeah, it just gives them more more to do. And by removing Drake, um, I mean, sure, Chloe's somewhat snarky, but she's more grounded. So you have just Sam as the snarky one, but he's being put in place by Nadine because those two have a history. And yeah, more than anything else, it just gives Nadine a chance to be a character when the game sort of gets going. Because initially, um, Chloe and Nadine don't like each other. They're just on a job together. And it's as they go on this adventure, they can actually start having the conversations and sort of you know, getting under each other's skin and picking apart. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed Lost Legacy. I don't know whether I'm sort of overselling it or misremembering it being better written than um, than it actually is. I have seen but... a lot of people that don't like Uncharted 4 say exactly what you've said, that it is. Mm. it, it oh, feels like a man. proper Uncharted game. So Yeah, because yeah. you know me, I didn't like Nadine at all. She's just, she's just a bruiser, essentially. She just turns to be the hard muscle, and that's her character. Whereas I came away from Lost Legacy going... I rather like Nadine as a character, so clearly they did something right. Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll check it out eventually. Uh, uh, yeah, eventually. Um, for now, the I need stink to... of Uncharted Four's been washed off your hands. Yeah, I need to push on with this just because yeah, I'm, need stubborn. I'm stubborn. I'm <laughs> stubborn. Need to finish this on crushing and then get the trophies and things and whatever else. But um, hopefully, it won't be too too long. I we'll have to see. Mm. I mean, that that's the kind of the good thing, I suppose, with. Um, with these games is that you can almost get a lot of the trophies as you're playing the games and then yeah. some of the more stupidly complicated ones are you know you just, just like pick out as five you minutes yeah. yeah just to grind out on a on a random level so yeah well it's that level of stubbornness that's led you to things like you know platinuming dark souls and co yep yep maybe yep Oh god, that was a miserable experience. I try not to even think about. I think I've had this conversation with you before that Bloodborne, Bloodborne turned into such a euphoric platinum. Mm. Um, getting to the end of that, and Dark Souls was just, just miserable from beginning to end. So I don't even because <laughs> I'm not even proud of that. It's just it's just miserable. It was just work. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> One of the things that makes me think, what am I doing? <laughs> 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 so you're not tempted to play the third or second one at any point. I well, think I will the play the um, third one. I might play the third one because apparently that that one is more enjoyable. It's, it's like a Bioshock situation, isn't it? It's like yeah. Uh, first one, you know the uh, the well-respected one from the auteur, and then the second one was kind of taken away from the auteur mm. and done a little bit differently, and then the third one's back to form. That's, that's kind of what yeah. I heard. It's, it's just a shame that it's the third one, and it's not as visually interesting as the first one, which is just so unique and dynamic because so connected. Mm. You know, it, it feels like a fully functioning... Well, it is. It's a fully functioning world. You see the world map, and it, it functions. It's incredible. The third one feels a bit sort of um, stuck together in places and, and a lot of the aesthetic is, it's a beautiful game, you know, it's a beautifully depressing looking game, yeah. but it, it doesn't have any of the, the splendour or the, oh shit, just draw dropping splendid uh, artifices of the, uh, the first game. Yeah, let me have a look at um, how hard Dark Souls 3 is to plant. According to PSN profiles. The only stuff that's really holding me back is, I mean, I've got to play it through another two times, um, which I'm refusing to do until I beat the Rider of the Storms, who is a, just a fucking nightmare. Um, so until I've beaten him, I'm not going to restart the game again. And I think all I have to do is get the various, like, Master of Pyromancy and Master of Spells, because I, I never tend to go down that line. I tend to mm. just stick with my sword and, and hack and slash my way through rather than dabbling in something new. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, at some point I've got to go back through, but until I beat that Rider of Storms, it ain't happening. And uh, <laughs> I've been trying for four years now. Well, um, it's got a difficulty rating of 7 out of 10, three playthroughs, 80 hours. So, I mean, that's a... Uh, that's uh, that's 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 a one. Uh, let yeah. me let me see. What it's mainly because you've got to you've got to sort of commit to one style, and you've got to make sure you hit certain story beat. Yeah. In order to, you know, get the the, the final pyromancy or the final like uh, charm, magic, and all that jazz. Yeah. Um, Bloodborne in comparison. What, what's Bloodborne? 
Probably quite low, I'd imagine. Oh my god, Bloodborne's an 8 out of 10. Wow. What? Yeah. Wow, I felt prouder for that one now, then. Yeah. Uh, only 50 hours, it said, it should take here, so hmm. that's the difference. Uh, Bloodborne... Uh, oh, it says in Bloodborne 1 playthrough. I suppose that's if you use the glitch. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose. I was going to say, you, you can literally get all but, you know, the, the two alternate endings hmm. within the first playthrough. That's how I did it. Um, hmm. Yeah, uh, apart from, you know, the uh, finishing the labyrinths, the only thing that was left for me to do was just play the game two more times. Oh, actually, the um, Dark Souls 3 and Dark Souls 1 trophies are actually pretty uh, identical in the in the run-through. Pretty much do the same things, I think. Play through it three times and, uh, you know, uh, d different ways of beating it, different collectibles, uh, a second playthrough opens more collectible. You, you know what I mean? Mm, um, yeah. So yeah, it looks like it'll be exactly the same type of <laughs> miserable experience. <laughs> mm. Only with a less interesting world to traverse. Yeah. Oh, I. I ugh, well, that's what you say. I hated the original Dark Souls. Oh my God, it's just getting PTSD thinking about it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's, well, it's it's strange because I I as, as I say I appreciated um, Yarnum with with Bloodborne. Um, mm. it just and then grew sort to, of... yeah, it, it, it infused itself in my soul and I understood why everyone loves it so much. I, mm. I just don't understand that with the original Dark Souls. I, I, I just, it, it's, it just, it's like being trolled <laughs> mercilessly, mm. um, that, uh, that, I can't even remember what it's called now, um, that, that specific, uh, region. What is it called uh, in Dark the... Souls? Oh, um, Anto Lono is the, the main citadel. Yeah. What is the name? Uh, I remember like the areas like Sen's Fortress mm. and the Farling Shrine, but um, yeah, uh, is it Andor? No, Andor Lono is definitely the city realm. But is... hang on, let's see. I mean, like the um, yeah, I, I suppose, like you say, the uh, Lordran. That's it. Lordran. Yes, yes, of Lordran. course. Yeah, Lordran. Um, yeah. I mean that that is phenomenal. The um, um, what do you say it was called? Arden, Laden, uh, uh, Londa. Yeah, that's the one. The, uh, the 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 massive castle structure is uh, is insanely brilliant. Well, there's more of that in uh, Dark Souls Three. In fact, some of my favourite moments of the series are in Dark Souls Three. Um, uh, the, sort of the, the larger but completely untold interconnecting story. The um, in fact, it might actually be Andor Londo you go back to, hmm. uh, with Pontiff Sullivan ruling over it, and the uh, one of the four Lords of the Embers, who's sort of this horrible slug creature that's uh, ruling over this uh, this iced over citadel. And it, it feels like um, uh, what, what's it? Uh, Cursed Castle Canehurst. Canehurst. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's uh, Castle Canehurst. If that were Andor Lono, so just going oh, to wow. this giant iced over city of like giant knights and uh, and giant icy cathedrals, and it is stunning. It's probably my favourite part of the game. It's a bitch, and you've got to learn to parry very quickly. Mm. But just in terms of something a bit different, because it's a world of just ash and, and death everywhere, and then it's like, ooh, this is this is a bit different. There's a bit of white and colour and, and change here. That's just something. A, a fun environment. Huh. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of Uncharted 4, I guess. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm mis miserably playing it until uh, I get it out of the way, then I never have to play it again. Uh, I mean, I haven't even really properly touched on the story beats that aggravate me, but again, I'm just <laughs> not. I, I've, I've said for years and years and years, I'd love to um, be bothered enough to do it. Uh, a video for YouTube about why I think Uncharted 4 is uh, is, is a bad game, a bad Uncharted experience. Uh, mm. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do it eventually. Uh, let me see. Uncharted 4 is bad. Put that into YouTube. Let's let's see what we got. Um, oh, I remember the, uh, the Game Grumps or the only players being pretty bad on it. Oh, they but they they, they hate Uncharted. Up. They hate they hate Uncharted. Anyway. Um, maybe mm. there is. So, uh, we've got Vidukino from five years ago, which is strange. I would have thought I'd have seen this. Uncharted 4 is boring. Naughty Dog is pretentious. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll try these. Uh, I'll try watching these later. 
Uncharted 4, five years later. Uncharted 4, The Ultimate Critique. Oh, that's from three days ago. Interesting. Oh, say. three hours. Joseph Anderson. Uh, Joseph Anderson? Uh, Uncharted uh, 4. Oh, no, that, that's a gameplay critique from five years ago. It was one by Luke Stevens from three days ago. Uh, that's three hours, 50 minutes. The Ultimate Critique. So, I mean, I don't know... Um, uh, I don't know uh, if that's good or bad, but um, yeah. Why Uncharted 4? The sound was disappointing. Um, for, by giggles. <laughs> uh, yeah, interesting. Um, the, oh. the game that doesn't make any sense, Uncharted 3. Okay, that's that's <laughs> be interested. To Must admit, I, I was struggling badly with Uncharted 3. Uh, Uncharted yeah, that... 3 is a game that I think I struggled with more on replays with its um, uh, just a few things it does. But I, 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 I felt the, um, the the story compelled me enough in Uncharted mm. 3 to keep me going. I think it's just the... the... I don't know. I, I can't really pin it down, but I just remember having a fairly miserable time with pretty much all of Uncharted 3. Um, mm. I, I'm not the biggest fan. I rather enjoyed the first game just for the sort of exotic locations. I know everyone holds up 2, and I like 2 for the um, the character interactions and the dialogue, not so much the, the gameplay. Mm. Um, and 3, I just found a fairly miserably frustrating experience. Mm. Um, yeah, so... Hmm. Yeah, I, I can appreciate them for what they are, but Uncharted are games that I prefer to hold in my memory as something I enjoy. But the moment I try and prove or disprove that theory, um, I, I rapidly delete the games from the uh, from the hard drive. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Um, right, uh, you you sent me over a massive list, so let's let's reel through these quickly. We've got right, we've got uh, ten, we've got fifteen minutes. To um to to go through uh, any topics. Do you want do you want to do rapid fire topic? Uh, sure, discussion? sure. Uh, so on the opposite scale of Uncharted Four, which is just bad characters, bad writing, bad story with no supernatural elements, and um, and your stubbornness pushing you through, Bly Manor is great. You should. <laughs> I keep selling you the various works of uh, Michael Flanagan with uh, Midnight Mass being mm. like last year's magnum opus. Um, but yeah, the, the Haunting of Bly Manor is just wonderful. Just this slow burner ghost story that doesn't really have too much in the way of horror. It's got its moments, you know, some, some creepy moments, nothing that really, like, will stay with me as, like, just uh, memorably scary. But just really 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 solidly written characters with good payoffs great payoffs and everything just weaves organically and everything is so natural in its progression and uh, by the time you get towards the end of the series and and just the mysteries are really compelling as well you know you want to find out why things are happening why characters are doing this um at what point the pieces are going to fall into place every time they're revealed it's like oh okay that's good and it's satisfying and it makes sense and it compels you to want to know what the mysteries are and uh, yeah i was i was absolutely enthralled with it and the ending just it, it got an emotional reaction out of me i'll admit i was i mm -hmm. i was quite emotionally taken with the uh, the ending of the series um is it just the one yeah. series yeah just nine episodes one, one off and done um yeah. that, absolutely great in terms of his characters it won't be everyone's cup of tea um uh, the, the previous season haunting of hill house is a lot more focused on the atmospherics and and the ghosts and and the creepiness and the, and the scares that's mm. still solid character work um but Bly Manor I I think you would really like Bly Manor just as a a character piece more than anything else yeah there, there's not a single member of the the cast that I didn't want to be spending more time with as the show went on that is very interesting run time in total eight hours 14 minutes hmm Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll definitely make that the next thing I watch. I think. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, you should certainly do that in Midnight Mass. Um, uh, Midnight Mass is, oh, is Midnight Mass better? Ooh. Is that his other show? 
Yeah, that's the one that came out uh, the tail end of last year. Uh, oh, is he? In fact, we were talking about it on the show. Yeah, we were. About, yeah, um, sorry. I, I thought yeah. we were talking about um, Bly Manor. I thought that that was... I, I, oh, I've got confused. So it seems as though... I, I was ne- talking about Bly Manor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I mean, um, the last one, the, the last time we were discussing a Michael Flanagan TV show, I thought it was Bly Manor and you'd maybe only watch the first episode or, or something, but... Um, ah, but he, yeah. I'm just looking at it now. He actually has like a um, an agreement with Netflix just to make one-off mm-hmm. single series of um, kind of yeah. um, horror-themed um, shows. That's that's amazing. Yeah, it's it's great. He is really really good. Um, yeah, can't can't recommend it enough. It, it was certainly my bag. Uh, I'm I'm pretty sure it'll be yours as well. Um, Say not for everyone. Uh, it's very pacey. It's not going out of its way to be scary, uh, or even atmospheric half the time. But mm. as I say, just just great characters more than anything else. Um, did, so that was a plus. <laughs> did you watch the Haunting of Hill House? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very good as well. Um, that's more traditional, spooky, scary ghosts. Mm. Um, Still, that Michael Flanagan is is good at character dialogue um, yeah. and, and good characters, but I think because Hill House sort of hops around in terms of time, mm. um, so everything is it's all very organic. You know, it flows very naturally throughout the story. Yeah. Um, where but Bly Manor is like, okay, here's point A, and we're following through to point B, and every now and again we'll focus on a character that might sort of dip in and out of minor flashbacks mm. but for the most part we're telling it in a sequential order yeah oh, interesting. so you're sort of watching the mystery play out from point a to point b rather than hill house which is like okay we're in the future now we're going to find out what happened in the past and we're going to sort of like it the book you know sort of yeah hop between the two timelines as they progress until eventually both both timelines reach the the climax the climax of the um the historical events that led to where we begin the series at several years later and then also tying up with where the the future events are, are climaxing and how it all sort of dovetails and mm. um what's the word uh it's like poetry it rhymes <laughs> um which was the one that we saw that he wrote was it ouija origin of evil we uh, yeah origin of evil yeah which is far better than a prequel to Ouija has any right to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I that disturbed me and uh and was um impressive in its um um yeah, I, I was just impre- impressed from top to bottom with that. It's only got a 6.2 on IMDb, which is um yep. not as generous as uh, as it should be. It did uh, it did a lot of interesting horror things. It didn't rely on tropes. It um mm. It was very creative and outside the box. So, um, so yeah, naturally, I, it doesn't get the scores. <laughs> yeah, it's um, are these all Netflix shows? Something is killing the children. He's currently writing, which sounds a fantastic Ooh. name for a, a show. Yeah. Uh, the Midnight Club and uh, the Fall of the House of Usher, which is Netflix. Oh, so. fantastic! Oh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so yeah, he's got he's got three Netflix series out of the minute. The Haunting of Hill House, The Haunting of Bly Manor at Midnight Mass. Um, wow, a lot of stuff to dig into there. Then that's that's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he and he also wrote Doctor Sleep, the screenplay. So that's he did. Um, ah, very interesting. Um, funny. Oh, he, sorry. He he wrote and directed Doctor Sleep, which I mm-hmm. uh, I didn't. He, I wasn't even aware of that. And um, that was one of those things I started watching and then. Something happened. I literally got the first twenty minutes into it because I was I was looking forward to, to checking it out. And um, what happened? Something happened. I, I don't know if my um, in, my computer exploded or something like that. And uh, I just never got around to it again, which was frustrating. <laughs> oh no, it wasn't that. The um, the uh, the audio on the um, copy of the film I was watching was terrible, and I was just like, no, I'll, I'll, I'll find another way to watch this, and never did. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Now you've got incentive. Watch, uh, watch any of his stuff, and it will sort of encourage you to snowball effect and get through the rest of it. Mm, mm, I think it will. Yeah, definitely someone that uh, I think I'll um, uh, really start to appreciate the more I uh, see of his stuff. Mm, mm. Absolutely. Right. Um, you've got uh, five minutes. Six uh, minutes. 
Ooh. Uh, let's think. Uh, I can talk about a Doctor Who episode that I watched. <laughs> you had a long list of things that you wanted to um, discuss, didn't you? I did. Yeah. Um, well, we sort of we got through a fair few of them. Um, okay. Yeah. Sure. Well. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Um, okay. So, how's this for a concept? Uh, a right. <laughs> a reptilian prisoner escapes from his exile planet with an android, crash lands in medieval Britain, and starts manufacturing a plague because he can't return to his own planet um, or travel elsewhere in space, but he also can't live with the indigenous peoples of Britain because he's a giant lizard monster, so <laughs> that ain't going to work. He's from the future, and they're throwback primates. So he's engineering a super plague that will wipe out all of humanity the black death and he's using his android disguised as the grim reaper to help foster the idea that it's like the walking death to help keep people away and the doctor sort of stumbles in and all this and and it was just a really entertaining sort of high concept episode from what? What 1981 or 1982, oh, okay. I think, the Peter Davidson era. Hmm. Um, yeah, just a, a four-part episode arc called The Visitation. Uh, yeah, they, they sort of um, just took a, a really neat, interesting idea. So that was that was an hour and a half of my life, which I was happy to uh, to invest. Back when Doctor Who actually tried to follow um, science fiction themes of more intellectually superior uh, writers and, and, and thinkers and integrate it into their own uh, storytelling. I, Absolutely. I hmm. Where he would actually have conversations with the villains and try to help them with their situation. And they're talking <laughs> a sort of no win scenario where eventually uh, you've got to kill them because if you don't, it's going to be, well, just the, the, the black death will be unleashed upon Britain. So what more can you do? Was there a, um, was there, I mean, I know that Doctor Who predated Star Trek, but was, it, was there ever kind of like a, a, a uh, so, uh, like a, a what's the best way to phrase this? A a, crossover? F no, no, no. Like a, a philosophical um, appreciation or bouncing off of each other of one, a, a relationship in 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 the writing of them both was was there ever you know like um any nods to that inspired that or were they you know kind of like it, it I guess in the way to. Uh, the Beach Boys and the Beatles kind of had a thing mm. in the '60s where one spurned on the other. It was did anything like that ever exist between Doctor Who and Star Trek at all? Do you know? Not that I'm all that aware of. Star Trek was created with the idea of humanity reaching its apex. This, this, uh, not euphoria, uh, utopia where everything is just in harmony. And Doctor Who was created with the intention of being a an educational show about. British history and science and everything oh, okay. else, but just wrapping it up with this sort of um, adventure. So it was both a combination of it was action, drama, sci-fi, but educational. So Sorry. the first series, we've got like the Centurions and, and Romans and various other bits and bobs with the science garble thrown in there as well. Oh, yeah. And then it became more fantastical as it went on. Um, the only thing I can really think of is that with things like Star Trek and Star Wars having the big American budgets... Um, the the comparison where Doctor Who just looked progressively cheaper. Um, mm. Even though there's some still really impressive stuff, and you look at it now through the filter of, you know, it is what it is. They were working with the limitations of what they had, but at least the ideas were great. There's one uh, Tom Baker episode uh, written by Douglas Adams, and the, the story is that there's an alien from, like, the dawn of time that gets exploded forward in time uh, to... Uh, the, the 1970s and is now an art mogul and in his <laughs> vault he's got six identical copies of the Mona Lisa and they're all originals none of them are counterfeit and through various time hopping shenanigans you find out that he's got sort of like a direct access to Leonardo da Vinci who he's, he's making paint him multiple copies of the Mona Lisa so that he can sell all of these original counterfeits off to different people for millions of pounds so that he can afford to to build the technology he needs to catapult himself back in time to his spaceship <laughs> before the explosion knocked him out of time. And it's just, it's so Douglas Adams and it's so Tom Baker, just the, the perfect meshing of these, these charismatic idea laden individuals. And it's just like, yeah, this is, 
this is great sci-fi. Yeah. Um, there's Peter Davison episode uh, in season 19, the original season 19 back in 82, mm. where there's like this frog creature that thinks he's God. And so he wants to travel back in time to meet himself. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, yeah, that's high concept stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, the elements like that in Star Trek. Um, but uh, I suppose because Doctor Who didn't have the budget, it had to make do more on the sort of the writing and the yeah. philosophizing and the grandiose ideas. That's interesting. Mm. Mm. Well, that's a, that's a nice little history lesson. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Hmm. Um, okay, Matt. Enjoyed that episode as a whole. And I, I mean, we haven't done one of these in a while. It was a nice to um, get back into the groove of things. Um, usually, we're kind of hampered down by technical difficulties, but uh, but this <laughs> week has been pretty good. So, so yeah, <clears throat> we that was a nice little warm up for the forthcoming weekend, where we'll be spending ridiculous amounts of time discussing uh, Twilight Breaking Dawn Part One. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's going to be nothing but justified time, to be honest. I agree with you. I, I, I certainly do. Um, uh, if, if nothing else, I feel happier to invest this amount of time into these films than I did Transformers. <laughs> <laughs> your relationships, your, your family <laughs> dynamics, your work ethic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quality time with people that... Uh, that will no longer be around in years to come. I can say, yeah, well, that those, those hours I spent um, discussing Twilight. <laughs> Puts it <laughs> into perspective. Things that you'll look back on your deathbed and go, I did that. Yeah. Uh, so yes, we'll be doing that this weekend, and um, that'll hopefully be up on Monday or Tuesday. Um, yeah, great. Enjoy that, Matt. Uh, thank you for spending time with me. Thank you for spending time with us we will be back at the same time next thursday uh 9 p.m uk come and hang out no one ever does but uh, it'd be cool if um if you do <laughs> <laughs> you specifically yes i'm talking to you um me i'll do it yeah where have you been recently you, you never turn turn up to hang out i know i just send my uh my algorithm out and it just sort of Great, the voice code needed to make you think you're having a conversation with the real me. We need an algorithm. The algorithm's deserted us, so if you can supply algorithms, then absolutely. I can supply us an algorithm track. <gasps> algorithm. Name of my new band. Right, okay. Cheers, guys. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll speak to you soon. Take it easy. Farewell. Goodbye. Bye. Adios. Adios.